When Jesus saw the crowds, when Jesus saw the crowds, there's more going on in just those first few words of this reading than meets the eye. Jesus is seeing he has less to do with physical sight than with spiritual vision. In the very first words of Jesus' very first teaching in the first gospel of the New Testament, Jesus begins with blessing. Not with judgment, not with terms and conditions, not with penance or altar calls or the sinner's prayer, but with blessing. Nine blessings, or beatitudes to be exact. You who are poor in spirit, who are mourning, who are gentle, who hunger and thirst for justice, who show mercy, whose hearts are clean, those who work for peace, who are persecuted for the sake of justice, slandered and reviled and hated. Blessed are you. Jesus begins with blessing, you, yes, you. You whom the world disqualifies, dismisses, and disenfranchises. You are near and dear to the heart of God. You are seen, you are loved, you are blessed. This is yours and everyone else's God-given identity. And it's a gift given without condition or measure. Beginning there, some popular ways that these blessings of Jesus have been understood are decisively challenged. These beatitudes are not greeting cards. They are not sentimental. Even that word blessing has become so bland that it's lost a lot of its meaning, or worse, is just equated with material wealth and success. Hashtag blessed, anyone? These blessings are filled with real hope, though, for those with little or none. But they are not band-aids, either. Hope, after all, is not a sedative, but something that gets us moving again, gets us ready and willing to face life's inevitable fears and failures with courage and grace. For those here among us this morning who find themselves among those whom Jesus named, I hope you really hear this today. Blessed are you. These blessings of Jesus are also not a to-do list. As the Reverend Debbie Thomas says, they are not suggestions or instructions, commandments or quid pro quos. There is nothing transactional about them, nothing that smacks of a should, a must, or an ought. It is emphatically not the case that if I try very hard to be poorer, sadder, meeker, hungrier, thirstier, purer, more peaceable, or more persecuted than I am right now, that God will like, love, reward, or appreciate me more than God does already. These blessings of Jesus are not permission slips for passivity. To use Jesus' teachings about sorrow and Meekness and poverty and persecution to keep oppressed people oppressed is to distort his words and really to render them monstrous. There is nothing in the Beatitudes that excuses injustice, nothing that relativizes abuse, nothing that frees us to tell suffering people that their suffering is somehow God-ordained and redemptive. Nothing. And finally, these blessings of Jesus are not pie in the sky. When Jesus promises the kingdom of heaven, he is not asking us to grit our teeth and wait patiently for death to come along and alleviate whatever hell we're living in. He's not handing out the afterlife as an opiate, as if our messy and earthly ordinary lives here and now don't matter dearly. To possess the kingdom, to experience comfort, to inherit the earth, to be filled, to receive mercy, to see God, to be called the children of God. These are not just about life after death. They are about the kingdom that is already and not yet. 
the realm of God that is present and coming, the reign of God's perfect justice and mercy that is within and among us right now and ahead of us still. So, we know what they're not. So what are these blessings of Jesus? Well, they are exactly that, blessings that reveal life as it really is and will be. Blessings. This is where Jesus begins and where all of our journeys following Jesus begin. Wherever the road takes us, whatever we learn from Jesus from here as we journey throughout Matthew's gospel this month, however our faith takes shape and form and is given expression, we do so from a, that place of God's blessedness. It is always a response from that grounding in God of being relentlessly included into God's embrace love and care. It's from that place that we find, too, we might be a blessing to others. If there is a summons, a, a call from this text, I think these are the questions we might ask. What if we, like Jesus, began with blessing? What if that vision were our lens as well? I had the privilege of driving Bishop Flunder, our wonderful, wonderful preacher, last week from the hotel to the church. And as pastors often do, we started sharing stories about our respective ministries, the blessings and the burdens. She said, you know, pastor, I've preached a lot on a message called Be the Book. She went on to say, I'm interested not just in talking about the words of scripture, but how those words find expression in my life and in the lives of my community. And then she looked at me with this smile and she asked me, so, Pastor, how is FCCLA being the book? I responded, well, I'm preaching next week, Bishop, and I'll ask them. <laughs> how are we the blessing of God in the lives of others? How do we share generously from the blessings of God in each of our lives? I've heard now on more than a few occasions in the six months I've been here in L.A. that Angelinos notoriously stay in their own bubbles. Whether because of the relentless traffic or having just what we need on our own block, we tend not to venture out often, so I'm told. But when we do, like the 8,000 or so that did during last week's count of those experiencing homelessness, we are quickly confronted with the realities of disturbing social inequities and staggering inequality and suffering in our city. Nita Leleveld, a columnist with the LA Times, endeavored to do more than just count last week. She told of a story this week in the Times about Patty, who holds a sign daily on the northbound ramp to the 101. Nita, after months of driving past her, forgetting about her as soon as she hit her left blinker, finally ventured to her on foot. She asked her, what would bring immediate comfort while you wait for housing. Patty responded, well, a soft blanket, a Subway gift card, and a tarp card to get me to Burbank to this place that has hot showers. It was in that intimate exchange that the scope of the crisis finally hit Nita and the massive changes that need to happen on an institutional level, housing and jobs, access to affordable treatment for addiction and mental illness. Indeed, as Desmond Tutu so simply reminds, there comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river. We need to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. But what Nita found in her immediate power and means to do in that moment, and something just as necessary, was that one-on-one -on -one interaction, person to person, she wrote, I would argue that many experiencing homelessness desperately need basic human kindness, which we can offer as individuals while we work as a society to try to get them that much bigger aid. Loving contact with anyone who is isolated, or lonely, ostracized, and ignored can indeed do a great deal. A woman named Catherine read Nita's words and decided to do something herself a $25 Subway gift card for the veteran 
that slept night after night outside her workplace. What message do I write? She pondered as she sat in her car. She finally filled in the back of the card. To you. From the world. And in the message line, she wrote, I see you. I see you. Jesus saw the crowds. And I think it's going to take that kind of vision from each of us. The obliteration of me and you, and us and them, once and for all, to that ever-needed, ever-vital collective we. Always we. That's the language of beatitude. That's the shift that could change it all. I am not fully well until you are fully well. None of us is truly free until everyone is free. Henry Nouwen in his book, The Wounded Healer, writes, Jesus' appearance in our midst has made it undeniably clear that changing the human heart and changing human society are not separate tasks, but are interconnected as the two beams of the cross. Jesus was a revolutionary since he did not offer an ideology but himself. He was also a mystic who did not use his intimate relationship with God to avoid social evils of his time, but shocked his milieu to the point of being executed as a rebel. Jesus, says now, and remains for us a path to liberation and freedom. Beyond a rediscovery of the radical, revolutionary Beatitudes for me this week was what surrounded them, what bookended them in both Matthew chapter 4 and Matthew 8, when Jesus' first sermon ends. The story is essentially the same. Jesus traveled throughout the Galilee, proclaiming the kingdom of God and healing all who were brought to him. In other words, action surrounds Jesus' words. His vocation, his life, was a beatitude for the world. He became the book, writing each word, each line, each chapter with his life. What story do our lives tell? How might our words and lives bless others? Might we find ways to be a little kinder than necessary? Be generous even with our smiles or where we're willing simply to look and fix our eyes. To see with a spiritual vision, to ask of the nameless thousands whose names are known and beloved to God. What's your name? What is your story? Tell me about your family. What would bring immediate comfort to you right now? I see you. How might God be asking us to be more generous with whom we're willing to include because we've been included by God? How might we examine how our own comfort and social positions keep us from seeing the divine in others? One might call these the ultimate questions that bring meaning and purpose to our lives, and they are. But to answer them, to live them, I think, is to discover what it truly means to be hashtag blessed. Amen.